Thank you so much, Lizzie, for coming on Wellness Your Way. I'm thrilled to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Of course. You share so much wonderful information on your social media, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, as we go through this. I already feel inspired based on my brushing up on you before we started recording. So thank you for all the good information you're sharing. Of course. Yeah. I mean, it's my passion and purpose to to share that information and to help. So amazing. Well, I've read your formal bio for our audience, but why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So um, I'm Lizzie. I am a nutrition wellness coach and uh, author, and I empower women to empower themselves to confidently step into the body that they love using a combination of nutrition, movement, and mindset. Oh, I love that. So succinct and so powerful. And I already know a lot of people are relating to what you're saying. I know from what you put on your website and elsewhere that you're often talking specifically to women who are burnt out, kind of high achieving, doing all the things, but they're still not feeling good enough, which I know is a lot of my audience, unfortunately, and and certainly part of my own journey as well. Why do you think there are so many of us feeling this way? That's a really great question. Um, And there's probably several different reasons. Um, I feel like, in my opinion, one of the key reasons is is that we're kind of in this hustle culture um, that really um, uh, awards working hard and achievement and um, kind of encourage us to seek external validation as opposed yes. to getting our validation internally. And that can kind of keep us chasing the carrot on the stick, as it were. Um, yes. So I know from my experience, you know, when I was a student, I would always study to get the top grade. Yes. And even if I got the top grade, I would be disappointed if I wasn't the first in the class. And yes. so this kind of like constant chasing of, um, you know, a, a, a moving goalpost, I think that keeps us um, feeling very stuck yeah. and also feeling very, very burnt out. So, yeah. I absolutely agree. And I, I think about how tough it is to raise children these days or to be a teacher, to be in any of these influential roles where we realize that praising achievement is not always the best. I look back at my own history and my parents were very well-meaning in praising my achievement and my teachers and everyone else who praised achievement. But I think in doing that, we learn exactly what you said, that we're good because we achieve. You're good because you were the top of the class or whatever. And we forget that we're good just because we are who we are. That's a really hard lesson for us to learn at this point for many of us. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like, um, you know, as babies, babies don't ever judge themselves for what they are and aren't achieving. And so for a lot of my clients, they kind of believe that this is, you know, something that um, has to always be the way and that they've always been like that. And whilst it might feel like, yeah like that as a newborn you weren't like that and so it's not a matter of like achieving anything or you know starting something new it's a matter of reclaiming that sense of internal self-worth right absolutely yes I agree completely So a lot of times for people, this achieving mentality bleeds really closely into our health when we feel like we're not X enough, we're not healthy enough, we're not organic enough, we're not, we don't fit into this pants, we're not whatever, um, doing enough skincare strategies. There are a million different ways that we can tell ourselves we're not enough related to health specifically. And this leads a lot of people into some very unfortunate, in my opinion, I think yours too, fad diets and, and other kind of scary things. I know you spend a lot of time helping people ditch these fad diets and kind of reclaiming their own health in a more holistic way. Can you tell us about this strategy or your own path to get to this place? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so passionate about doing this work 
because um, I'm sure for a lot of people who are in this industry and who work in health is that we've been on our own journeys. Yeah. Um, and I know that you mentioned um, just now that kind of you've been through your journey to, yes. you know, overcoming that high achiever, overachiever, yes. you know. And so I have been on my own journey to really um, battling with my body. And, and I mention it a little bit more in, in my book, Reclaim the Rebel, but essentially um, I began as a 14 year old who loved running, who um, wanted to help her granddad feel better um, mm -hmm. whilst he was going through chemotherapy and I baked him a lemon drizzle cake. And so at the time I thought I was, you know, um, being good and, you know, doing something that kind of um, made someone else feel good. I was um, also, you know, a very high achiever in school. As I mentioned, I ran. And then a couple of days later, my granddad passed away from a heart attack. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I appreciate it. And it's, it's kind of a little bit of the bittersweet ending to the story because it was his death that made me really question my decisions over food and I thought somehow uh -huh. I'd killed my granddad with this cake, uh -huh. and I was like oh my goodness I need to learn how to be healthy because I'm not mm. being healthy enough right that story of mm -hmm. life. and so I looked to uh, magazines at the time there wasn't really social media but I got some really bad advice and really um went into a um a negative relationship with my food and my body and ended up suffering for 10 years from anorexia wow and it was through this journey though that I discovered the tools that I now use to help my clients so that they don't get to that place that I got to um mm -hmm. at least to the extreme um lengths that sort of maybe I pushed my body to um and so I'm really passionate about making sure that women nurture their bodies in a way that is very balanced and very aligned to self-love. And I think self-love is something that maybe we roll our eyes at or it's an Instagram hashtag, but essentially self-love I think is a, it's a vibration, it's an energy that we can be in um, that is kind of like a compass to how we're treating ourselves. So um, you know, that's kind of like my journey and my um, experience of finding the tools to help me feel in alignment to that energy. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of vulnerability. And my heart breaks for that sweet 14 year old Lizzie who baked the cake out of ultimate compassion and then felt really guilty about it. So I, I, hate it, honestly, to hear from so many people, myself included and you included, who had to go through these lows in order to uh, be able to do our work. But goodness, how you've twisted it for the better. You said it's bittersweet. Uh, and it, it sounds like a bittersweet story. Now you're able to do this amazing work and help so many people. So I'm grateful for that. Um, I'm, I am I'm rolling my own eyes at asking this question, but I'm going to try to ask it anyway. You went through a 10 year journey of healing yourself. Can you name just some of the things? I won't even say the top things, but some of the things that helped you embrace self love throughout that 10 year journey, even when you were kind of in a place of self questioning or maybe even self loathing? Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good question. And I think, you know, really what came to mind immediately was having support yeah. because I feel like when we're going through some of these really um, sort of deep emotions and self-loathing, self-abusive thoughts, behaviors, um, it can feel very isolating. Yeah. And um, some of us high achievers um, want to do it on our own. Yeah. And so it takes a lot of courage um, and vulnerability to reach out and say, I'm struggling. I need help but it's so essential yes. to helping us through that journey because only we can do it. Only we can kind of like go through this whole process and apply the tools and, and, and make that, um, make that journey. Yeah. 
but having someone cheering us along and um, you know sharing that load that we're carrying can be such a game changer. So um, I call it having a cheer squad, a support network, whatever you want to call it. I think that's really, really essential. I love that. I I kind of chuckle at myself sometimes at ending up in this career path because I am the ultimate do it alone person. I. I was always the person in school and college and everything who hated group projects. Like I like to do it by myself. I like to be responsible. Yep. (laughs) For those who can't see us, Lizzie's raising her hand as well. And it only took going through those lows to realize that we do need support. We do need a coach. We do need whatever form of support is right for the person. And now thankfully I can admit that and, and obviously make it my career, but it, would have blown my mind at 15 years old or however old to tell me that I was in the coaching industry, which didn't even exist really back then. But even if it did, I I don't think I would have believed it. Yeah. And I think, you know, there are different forms of support that we can get. So, you know, some, some of us thrive really well in small group settings, some of us thrive, you know, in big groups. And so I think, you know, finding the cheer squad, or the form of support that works well for you is also a really beautiful learning experience because yes. can, it's like going to an ice cream shop and kind of trying all the different flavors. There's different yes. ways of getting support, right? Absolutely. I love it. One of the things that caught my eye, which I believe you highlight in your book as well, are the 12 rebellious acts to unconditional love for your body. I love this. I don't really identify as a rebellious person, but I think there's a rebellious nature inside of every single one of us, even those high achieving rule followers. So can you share one of these 12 rebellious acts with us? Yeah, of course. So um, as you say, like, I just love the idea of being able to rebel. Everyone's kind of like, oh, this is kind of naughty. I want to do that. And so um, one of the rebellious acts that I really love and that's really important to me is letting go of comparison. Mm. Um, because again, as high achievers, we can probably relate to the idea of comparing ourselves to others in order to know where we stand, in order to know that we are achieving, um, that we are the best or that we're, you know, doing well. Right. So that can kind of like lead us into the spiral of not feeling good enough. Right. Um, so by letting go of comparison, what we're actually doing is that we're all acknowledging that we're very different and very unique. Yeah. Um, and that can be very freeing for someone who is trapped in that kind of state of comparison. Yes. So let's say I'm listening to this podcast. I love the idea of letting go of comparison. I'm going to buy your book, which we'll link to in the show notes. And we'll talk a little bit more about as we go. But I want right now to be able to drop that idea of comparison. So I commit to it. And then an hour later, it just creeps up. I think about Sally and her arm strength, or I think about, you know, Betsy and her business or whatever. And it just naturally pops up, even though I've committed. What do I do then? Yeah. And the first step, I think, is, um, you know, acknowledge that you've got that awareness um, because awareness is the first stage in making changes so that's great you're aware of it um second step practice some self-compassion and just realize that we're all human and so even if we've kind of like made a commitment to something sometimes we're relying well we are always relying on certain subconscious programs and if we've had those subconscious programs in place for a while then um they're probably going to come up yeah and so you're not failing um if comparisonitis pops in yes um and then to change that what I really like to do is to go into gratitude for what I have Mm. because essentially what we're doing when we get into comparison is we're looking again we're looking externally we're like okay so that person has this 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 and this whereas gratitude brings us back to what we have and um kind of like is a way of, again, internally validating ourselves and realizing, you know, all of the amazing stuff that we have going for ourselves. And so whatever we're comparing ourselves um, to somebody else about, we can kind of bring it back to ourselves and go, well, you know, um, in my business, I'm serving clients from a place of love and I'm 
able to do this and you know you can kind of find a lot of things to be grateful for once you start with something small and then just kind of keep going so that would be the process that I would recommend and then I yes I love that so it's awareness and and recognizing that it's great that you were able to identify that give yourself some compassion and then practice gratitude and i i wonder if you agree sometimes when i say this to clients they're like i it feels inauthentic to say i'm grateful for x or i don't even know what i'm grateful for and me having practiced gratitude for like decades i'm like i could think of a hundred things but it's okay if it's hard at the beginning, it does become more natural with practice. So I wouldn't say do something that feels completely forced, but just try it out. Dip your toe in the water, try expressing gratitude for something, even if it feels really small and inconsequential. And I believe the ability will grow. What do you think about that? I completely agree. And so I find this a lot with my clients, especially when it comes to body image. Yeah, Um, because I also talk about in another rebellious act, the act of taking off our glasses and looking at ourselves in the mirror. Uh And I walk clients through an exercise where they look at themselves in in the mirror and look at body parts and reframe how they're talking to their body. And so it's it's very similar to gratitude. I don't um, recommend having a story about your body or a story about what you're grateful for that feels super inauthentic and forced but there might be some sort of discomfort at the start and the place to work from is something that does feel aligned and that we can believe and that does make us feel good Um, and once we kind of get started then that's when we kind of push the comfort zone out and out and out so yeah it's a process for sure I love this taking off your glasses and learning to love and, and at least respect at the beginning, your body. I think so many people in our industry will be on the polar opposite. Like just don't even ever look at your body. Your, your body's not important. You don't even have to think about your body. And I don't want it to be the most important thing ever. I want our our soul, our personality, our relationships, all of that, obviously to be more important. But the fact is, We're going to live with our body every single day that we're on this planet in this lifetime. And it really does serve us to learn to build some compassion and respect and love for our actual physical body in its current state. So I think your exercise would be really challenging for a lot of people, but I think it is so worth it. Can you, you described the exercise really well already, but could you reiterate it for anyone listening? Yeah, absolutely. And this is not something that I have made up personally. It's from Louise Hay. Um, She is the godmother of self-love, but it's essentially a mirror exercise where you stand in front of the mirror and you look at your body for a slightly uncomfortable amount of time. We talk about that mild discomfort and reframe the negative stories that we're telling ourselves into something more positive. And again, this isn't that toxic body positivity where you're just like, oh my goodness, I love every single part of myself. And it feels super inauthentic and fake. If it feels authentic to say, I absolutely love every part of me, great. great. But for a lot of us, that's not realistic, especially after years of these self-abusive thoughts. So really it's about finding something that does feel aligned. So I'll give you an example. I had a huge scar across my stomach from when I had um, an operation as a baby. And as a teenager, especially, I hated that scar. Mm. I um, was so self-conscious, wouldn't wear a bikini. Um, And so when I started doing this exercise, I would say to myself, I am so grateful for my survival scar. Yes. It's my... Um, sign of how strong my body is as opposed to oh my goodness it's such a beautiful thing Um, because it just felt a lot more realistic Um, so that's just one one example of the ways that you can kind of create a story that just feels a little bit better than what you're telling yourself right now oh I love that that's so wonderful highly encourage everyone listening to do that and like Lizzie said just take the next step towards something that feels more authentic. I, my example is if people say, oh, my, my calves are so big or something like that, I'll say, 
well, look at how strong your legs are and how they've carried you through every step of your life and how, how they allow you to do all these things through the day. So there is always a, a next step. I, I thank you for sharing that example. That's great. So you are already talking about taming that negative voice inside of our heads through a couple of your rebellious acts of self-care. But let's talk a little bit more about that pervasive negative voice that so many of us have. Do you have another strategy or thought uh, to help people tame that negative voice? Yeah, so the inner mean girl, (laughs) as I like to call her, um, she can get very loud um, and she can be very persistent. And so again, I think it all goes back to, first of all, being aware of her and when she comes up. And then really, I like to use the analogy of um, like picking clothes out of your closet. You know, you've got all of these thoughts, just like you have, you know, your clothes lined up for the day and you can pick from your closet, whatever thought that best suits you that day. And so once you have an awareness of the thoughts coming in, you can pick out a thought that feels good and that fits how you want to feel. And so, um, again, like this is a practice. (laughs) And so just like we choose our clothes daily, we practice trying on our thoughts daily. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some days you might be absolutely, you know, feeling amazing. And then something happens, um, despite years, even potentially of this work. And it's not necessarily a case of completely getting rid of the thought. It's moving through it. And then going to the closet and picking something out that just feels better. Um, And so I guess that's kind of my main piece of advice when it comes to facing that inner mean girl. I love that analogy. It's one I've never used before, but it's so representative. Some days I just go to my closet. I know exactly what I want to wear. I put it on. I don't think twice about it. It's natural. And then we all have those days when we go to our closet and we try on like four things and it feels like... (laughs) It's none of them are the right ones, but we have to keep trying and keep trying. And that's a great analogy for our thoughts. Sometimes it's not natural. Sometimes we got to try on four or five or 10 or 20 different thoughts before we end up with the one that feels most comfortable to us. And that's okay. We can go through the practice of recycling and choosing and dropping, even though it feels challenging at times, uh, it's worth it. I love that. That's great. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's something that um, I used to really get stuck on because I felt like it was a one and done process, right? Yep. You know, um, especially people who are in that kind of like mindset of I want to get this done and get mm-hmm. this done well. You know, you it's not a linear journey. So, you know, on those days where it is a little bit up and down, I think that analogy kind of made me feel um it it gave me permission to be more self-compassionate love that love it all right so I've seen you mention the Goldilocks zone which sounds like something I'm gonna love can you tell us what this is yes um so before we actually I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what the Goldilocks zone is and then I'll let you know a little funny backstory about why I call it the Goldilocks zone. You take it wherever you want to (laughs) go. So the Goldilocks zone is essentially that place of balance between um, two extremes. Mm. So what I see a lot on the internet is (laughs) um, the extreme of, um, you know, over-exercising, having completely clean eating, not Mm -hmm. having, um, you know, a, 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 piece of chocolate ever um burning ourselves out and um you know over almost overdoing it right and then at the other end of the extreme there is um the um there's the camp that kind of says if you love your body then um you don't have to move you don't have to eat a certain way and i like to think of having unconditional love for our bodies as in in the middle of this yeah and only we can define what this zone is for ourselves the yes. sun might be a little bit further along to one extreme or the other yep but I think it's all about balance 
Yes. And I know that my <laughs> my opinion isn't always, um, you know, uh, people don't always agree with this, but I think there is room for a place where we can want to improve our habits and our behaviors and potentially change our bodies, but coming from a place of self-love as opposed to self-hate. And so that's what the Goldilocks zone is. And I love it. I call it the Goldilocks zone is not because not only because, you know, the three bears and, you know, not too hot, not too cold, just right. Um, when I was at UCLA interning um, as the dietitian, because uh, I'm English, the athletes used to come in and um, they found it very funny when I would serve them breakfast in the morning and I would say, here's your porridge, ah. here's your oatmeal. And so I got the nickname Goldilocks. Oh, it just That's seemed fitting to call that zone of balance, the Goldilocks zone. I love it. Well, I think that's a, a funny story that I'm sure will help listeners remember. I love the principle so much. And I think I am fully aligned with you on this. It, 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 it might be fancier or more popular or sexier on social media to adopt one of those extremes, just like everything. People love the extremes. It feels nice to just be able to say, I never have to change anything I want about my body. I never need to eat a vegetable or whatever. And yet what I have experienced for myself and and for my clients is that actually sounds good on the surface, but inside physically, mentally, emotionally, it feels disempowering. It doesn't feel like you have any authority over your health, your body, any pride, any skin in the game, really. I think if we can come at it from a place of self-love, like you said, then working on ourselves is very empowering and wanting the best for ourselves, wanting the best nutrition, not perfect nutrition. I've got chocolate right here at all times. So oh I'm with you on the chocolate. I uh, love that 95%. You oh yeah. <laughs> I go all in. Sometimes this one, you're right, is 95%, but sometimes it's not that it depends on, you know, what I'm feeling that day. Uh, but yes, I, I believe completely in balance. And I also know that it helps me so much to be able to focus on uh, my health. So thank you for sharing that Goldilocks zone. How would you advise someone who wants to reach the Goldilocks zone? Let's take sugar since I just held up my chocolate. They hear us say, okay, some chocolate is fine. Yay, that's great news. Lizzie and Megan say some chocolate is fine. And they also know that they're drinking sugary coffee and then having candy and then having soda and then having all these things. And they don't physically feel good with the amount of sugar they're consuming. How do they start to find that Goldilocks zone? Great question. And so it will vary depending on what the, I think what the topic or the item is, but when it comes to food and nutrition, um, I really advocate listening to your body's cues and, um, I work from a pyramid structure. So you've got the basic option, you've got the better option, and you've got the best option. Love it. And sometimes we'll go for the basic option, which is like the sugary coffee or whatever, like yeah. something basic. Yeah. Um, and we can always choose that. And, you know, if we're choosing that from a place of, oh, yeah, that feels good today, then great. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if we want to, you know, um, improve our health or make a healthier choice then we can move up the pyramid and so maybe that might look like um i don't know like let's go with the example of chocolate so maybe the basic option would be a hershey's bar um and so you know moving up the pyramid we could choose i don't know like a dark chocolate bar um and then you could choose I don't know, um, a higher percentage of the dark chocolate bar. And so we can always upgrade our choices to align with a healthier option, but it doesn't always have to be the healthiest option. And I think really it comes back to that energy of, mm -hmm. am I doing this from a place of I have to, and this is a place of um, kind of guilt, shame, yeah. judgment, or am I doing this from a place of joy, self-love, peace? And so I would always just tune into that energy and, again, upgrade our energy from that shame, guilt, and judgment 
to happiness, peace, joy. Love it. Love that so much. And so let's say someone's going to fast food every day for lunch and that better choice might be, okay, you still get the burger, but maybe you get a side salad instead of the fries if they offer it. Or maybe you get water or iced tea unsweetened instead of the soda or something like that and just see how it feels. And if they can honestly say, oh yeah, I feel proud of myself. Maybe I had less of a sugar slump after, or I didn't feel deprived because I still got the burger or however they can connect to the positivity of that experience, that's what will keep them going instead of saying, oh my gosh, you're an imbecile, Megan, if I'm saying this to myself, why are you going to fast food again? No, celebrate that better choice moving up the pyramid, like you said, and that will make it feel more positive to continue. Absolutely. If anyone is listening, I'm just nodding while she's speaking. It's just, yeah, yeah, 100%. I think we're on the same page. And I have to say, I have not read your book yet, but I'm very excited to do so. Can you tell us a little bit more about Reclaim the Rebel? Yeah, thank you. And um, Reclaim the Rebel is essentially, it's available in um, online in Barnes and Noble and on Amazon. Um, and it's this really, it's designed to be short and kind of like your best friend in your handbag that you can carry around as Megan said, there are 12 rebellious acts with very practical exercises that you can apply to step towards that place of having the body that you love. So yeah, I'm excited for you to read it. I I cannot wait. And like I said at the beginning, I've been following along on social media. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the clients that you work with, what you offer on social media, just anything about you that listeners might want to know? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. That's probably the best place to connect. If you have any questions about um, anything that we talked about, then please just um, drop me a DM. Um, And I share a lot of tips and um, inspiration on my Instagram um, account. And then if you're interested in working together, I work with clients one-on-one and also um, offer some self-study options. So again, just reach out and I can kind of point you in the right direction there. Amazing. Now, I'm going to throw you a curveball as our last question, but I think you're going to knock it out of the park. If people listening want to take away one thing from this, one action step that they can take right now today, what's an action step that you would offer to them? Oh, yeah, that is a curveball, but I think I think I've got it. Yes, tell <laughs> and us. that is is to just make one choice today that you wouldn't have made had you not listened to this podcast. Love it. I love that. It's so empowering and it's so open-ended and everyone listening will make a different choice, but you know, listener, you know what's best for you. So take Lizzie's advice, make one decision that you would not have made otherwise. Highly encourage everyone to head to the link in the show notes and check out Lizzie's Instagram and book. Um, And Lizzie, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Of course. It's my pleasure. Thank you.